Greetings everyone, my name is Fidel Blitz here and welcome back to Tour of Earth, the Celestial Tower. This might be our final time on this grand, grand, rememberable adventure. There's one objective left to do, and it is the objective that we came to this tower for in the first place. To defeat the Dark One, and purge the land of its darkness, so that the world can once again be bright. But that mission is still the same, just in a different sense. Must banish the Dark One and free our friend from corruption. And that, of course, is our beloved friend Ruby. The music silencing. Ooh. Are you ready to enter? I am indeed ready. There is nothing else left to witness aside freeing our friend from corruption. Will 30 levels be enough to defeat our once friend? Four seats, you. Guess it's only a matter of time before the others show up, huh? Good. Maybe by now they finally got the hint. And if they haven't, well... I guess I'll just have to remind them who their enemy truly is. But if that no nosy little angel is with them, I'm going to have to deal with her too. What a pain in the ass. Does she know she's not wanted here? Ruby, this has gone on for long enough. If you have any honour left in you, you'll come and face us. Well, well, look who's finally here. It's the Gullion's Knight and the rest of the Peanut Gallery. Hmm. Ruby, have you really been here this whole time? Well, duh. An evil god needs her evil lair, after all. Surely you've played enough fantasy games to know that much. Is that what this is to you, Ruby? A game? Toying with our souls? Imprisoning them in this godforsaken tower? Was it all just a part of this villainous facade you've credited for yourself? Facade? Heh, <laughs> there you go again. Using big fancy words nobody else gives a crap about. I do. You call it a facade? I prefer to think of it as embracing my true calling. I'm the villain of the story, the traitor who has slayed you all in cold blood. So I might as well give it my all, right? That's a lie. You're not a villain, Ruby. You're our friend, and you always will be. When you did those things to us, you weren't yourself. Your fear made you lose your grip of reality. We all know that now. So why do you insist on acting this way? Trying to become our enemy, even when you know that isn't who you are? Wow. So let me get this straight. You won't call the person who held you hostage, slit your throat, and killed all your friends in front of you your enemy. I always knew you were kind of a doormat, Lily. But this, is just, this just crosses the line into pure stupidity. I am not your friend, a real friend, would never do the things I've done. Why can't you see that? Because you were not you when you did that. Your own demons controlled you. Because we refuse to fall for your tricks, Ruby. All this time, you've been trying to gold us into defeating you. But we're not taking the bait. You feel guilty for what you've done. We know you do. And now, you're seeking punishment for crimes you think are unforgivable. But we don't want to punish you. We want to save you. We want to bring you back. For real Ruby, who loved us and made us laugh. And leave us tower together. <laughs> Ruby, please, listen to us. This tale you're trying to weave where you are the evil to be slain at the hands of your friends. It will not give you the absolution you seek. What do you think will happen 
once you've been vanquished. Do you truly believe we would celebrate such a hollow and tragic victory? Surely we would not. Cast aside the mask. Embrace your friends and the precious forgiveness they have offered you. In heaven's name I beg you, stop this madness and save your soul from the clutches of your despair. You. You. <laughs> you're, you're kidding, right? Forgiveness after everything I've done to you? The scaling of despair has returned. God, you people are even dumber than I thought. Looks like I'm going to have to step up, step up my game after all. If you still can't call me your enemy after all that, I'll just have to make you suffer until you do. <laughs> Time for your destiny, Mistress of Darkness. Hmm. I don't know what you would employ, but I don't think you have any sort of magical attacks against us. Right, let's fortify ourselves for a battle ahead. Hmm. Provoke. Let's see. Lydia? Yikes. That's a bad one. I'm glad we did that to ourselves. As in... <laughs> grinded our way to level 30. Good. Perseverance works. You do that. You do Earthen Barrier on Edric and Amatel. And you shall bring forth Grand Hex. Let's just employ as much damage as possible. Lovely. Lovely. <laughs> you think that will do anything against us? Lovely. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Hmm. Maybe I shouldn't have done this, but then again, all good and fun. Let's see. I'm going to heal Sigurd and cure Amatel. You are going to do another Grand Hex. You are going to provoke Sigurd. Lovely. Oh, damn it. Lovely. Mm, thank you. I'm glad you're doing that. Whatever arrow storms you employ against us, as long as Lydia stays alive, it is impossible to defeat us, Ruby. It just literally is. Nature's blessing. Grand Hex. And another provoke on Sigurd. Lovely. Ouch. I don't like the set look of that. Keep on going. Keep on going. Keep on going. <laughs> Damn, they return to normal. Okay. You do that. You perform a earthen barrier on yourself. Let's see. See if we can get paralysis on Ruby. And you do a provoke on Lydia. Yes! We did it! Purity seal has worked. No sleeps for us. Thank you very much. Keep going. Keep going. We have no worries about resources since we're just, well, OP. <laughs> I don't care that we're OP on items. This is what we're here for. Lily again. Thanks for that. 
She can only employ physical attacks. There's nothing magical about what she does. Lovely. Do another Rally Cry. Earth and Barrier Sigurd, along with the Nature's Bliss. No, wait, we're going to actually do... Oh, we didn't even activate that. Hmm. Is there some other requirement to that? Like, having full MP? Or maybe we need to use it at the start of a battle. Oh, we've already used that. I was thinking of Lydia's one. My bad. Uh, lightning Strike again. Let's try and get one on him. Lovely, 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 lovely. Thanks. You're not going to paralyze, are you? No matter. Cool, you're going to perform... Oh gosh, look at all these items. <laughs> That's why we itemed up. Uh, I don't think paralysis works. I think Ruby is immune to status ailments. Um, or at least heavily resistant to them anyways. You're going to do Lydia just in case your um, defense goes down. Lovely. Prevent preparing for a devastating attack. What would that devastating attack be? I'm joking, you would never tell us. Lovely. Keep going. Keep going, my friends. Hmm. Earthen Barrier and Nature's Blessing for whatever may cast upon us. But then again, saying that nothing's yet come along. So, ah, mercy, we'll do that. You do that, and you provoke Sigurd. Damn it. Hmm. Was this the best idea? Close with a dark energy. <laughs> You thought that was some sort of ultimate attack, Ruby? You barely scratched us. Ooh, fallen. The party is victorious. Heavens. Okay. Enough of that shenanigans. Come forth. I'll admit, you guys have gotten pretty strong. Maybe even strong enough to destroy the Dark One once and for all. Well, what are you waiting for? You've come this far already. Just finish me off, why don't you? No, Ruby. We will do no such thing. Your friends have already made their choice. And they have chosen the path of compassion and forgiveness. No matter how much you hurt them, or try to push them away, they will not betray the memory of the ruby they know and love. You! This is all your fault. You screwed everything up! Why? Why the hell couldn't you leave well enough alone? Because I am an angel of truth. It is my duty and utmost desire to show you the truth, whether you want to see it or not. You will find neither justice nor redemption by doing this. All you will be doing is robbing yourself and your friends of the peace you so desperately need. But if you stop this fool's act now, you can repent, truly repent, and set yourself free of this burdensome guilt. So please, don't waste this chance. Come with us through the gates of heaven. Come home, Mira, to the arms of your creator. No. No. No! What on earth? What's going on? 
Ruby, what are you doing? Ruby? What are those four chairs representing? Um, hi. You went through there. She's gone. Damn it. Damn it all. We were so close to saving her. Another warp circle. Did Ruby leave, Ruby leave us behind? It appears so. If I assume correctly, we'll be able to use it to follow her. But to where? Wasn't this place supposed to be the tower's summit? How could she have possibly gone any higher? Not higher, Lilia. Deeper. Now that we've called her bluff and denied her plans, I suspect that she has retreated further inside of herself. And because Toravira acts as a mirror to your souls, we can assume that this psychological retreat also has a physical form, one where, heaven willing, we'll, we'll be able to find her. Then that's exactly what we're going to do. Wherever Ruby has gone off to, we'll have to follow her, even if that means diving into the heart of darkness itself. Well said. Well said. Hmm... Do a nature's blessing on all of you. Then I'm going to heal up. Like so. Goody, goody, good. So, have we got a save point somewhere? An empty golden throne sitting among pieces of shattered stained glass. Eek. No save points nearby. It would be wise to ensure we've adequately prepared before we leave this place. Once we depart, we may not be able to return. Ruby will likely stay hidden until we seek her out, so please take as much time as you need. Um, I think we'll save first before going in, just in case anything random happens between our descent into Ruby's darkened heart. Ah, oh, but music returns when we get closer to this place. Uh, hold on. Francis! You're still a good boy for being here, you know that. Good. And... two of those. Lovely. We are all prepared. Save the game. Absolutely. <laughs> to think that we started to defeat the Dark One. Now, we are parting ways defeating the Dark One, but we still got a journey's way to go. I believe we're going to once again venture into the past of some kind. So we could be even facing Mirror's form. Let's go, everyone. We'll most likely be facing enemies as well. Hmm. Final floor. The heart of suffering. This is truly a place which only Ruby could envisage. Gosh. What a necromancy name is here. What on earth? Where are we? We are deep within the vestiges of Ruby's mind. What the hell? There's so much blood. And those bones. Is this supposed to be some kind of dungeon or something? It would appear so. And a rather grotesque one at that. I'd hate to consider the implications of this place towards Ruby's current state of mind. Yes. The tower's projection of her psyche seems particularly strong here. Such a horrible place doubtlessly reflects the monster she sees her, see herself as, and her desire to be punished. It's as though the very heart of her suffering and guilt has been laid out for us to see. Then we must pierce every single sector of this heart. The heart of her suffering. Then we cannot allow her to languish in this place. We have to find her. We have to bring her back from the depths of 
from the depths of her despair. I think that's what it means, light. Right. This place lingers. Yep. Please note we cannot backtrack from the save point. Creating a separate fi save file is highly recommended. Then we will do that. Hmm. That way. It's just as I thought. We won't be able to leave this place until we've saved Ruby. So, in part ways, Ruby wants to be saved. What's with this writing? What the? Different forms of torment, it would seem. Do we just need to witness for more? A familiar young woman hangs lifelessly from the gallows. No, no, it can't be. Calm yourself, Sigurd. This isn't our friend. I don't sense her energy. It is simply another illusion conjured by, up by this tower. But we mustn't waste our time. Our real friend still needs our help. The blood of a young woman leaks from the cracks in the Iron Maiden's door. The young woman tied to the stake has been shot to the head. The young woman has been beheaded, leaving behind a horrific and bloody mess. I think that's supposed to be a horrific bloody mess rather than and horrific bloody mess. A ghastly display of four skulls skewered upon four metal spikes. Dried blood beneath the spikes has permanently stained the area red. Oh dear. And that right there, I don't know who that may be. A familiar young woman has been placed on a humiliating display in a cage. She appears to have resigned herself to such a fate. A shadowy spectator lairs at the morbid display, its single red eye filled with contempt and judgment. When we saw the eyes originally within that room, was this where it represented? An area within Ruby's life that was so desperate. A shattered clay jar filled with dust and cobwebs. The craters collapsed in on itself. It used to contain something that has now rotted away. Pile of bones, they all seem human. There are scratches on some of the bones that appear to have come from a knife. Ruby's knife. Hi. A little girl gazes silently at the two bodies before her. Likely her parents. Though she has no face, her grief and trauma are plain to see. A body wrapped in a white shroud tied with cloth ropes. Though the area around it is caked with blood, the body itself looks to have been lovingly and carefully cleaned. And the same with that one. A bucket. The liquid inside is of it is a dark and foul smelling. Hmm. Runes on the floor. Hmm. Can't use anything on you. I think we're supposed to just witness things rather than solve things. Oh dear. A note written in the phone language. Inspect it. Arabic. It has to be. I knew I recognized this script from our old world. Correct. It was your friend's mother's time in life, and that of her family. It's not surprising that we found such a note within her mental landscape. Allow me to translate. Dear Mira, I'm so sorry to have to leave you with this burden. Call the police. Do not come into the bedroom. I have missed your mother far too much, and now I've gone to join her in heaven. My greatest regret is that I allowed my fear to come become your fear. I tried to protect you, but I've robbed you of your innocence and trust in the process. You have become a fine woman. You will be stronger without your father holding you back. I love you, my daughter, and I hope you will forgive me. It's signed Baba, her father. Oh, Ruby. A 
chalk outline of a man drawn over a large blood stain. Upon first glance, the splatter on the wall appears to be from a gunshot. The crate is collapsing on itself. It used to contain something that is now rotted away. This is such a deep story. A cold wooden prisoner's bed, barely held in place with iron chains. A place of torment, punishment, or isolation. Stained with blood. Hmm. And what's with these rooms? Hmm. She's here, behind this door. Are you certain, Lilia? Yes, I can sense her spirit, her pain and anguish. Then we have to get in there. We have to save her. We are ready. This is the house. What? What is this? Those bodies. They can't be. Ruby. Mira. No. Mira, why? Why would you come here to such a horrible place? Why would you retreat to such a terrible memory? <laughs> you made it. Finally. Now we can finish this once and for all. What do you mean by finish this? Mira, you know this won't end the way you want it to. There's no way we can do what you're asking us to, so stop this already. Of course there is, you're a hero of justice, right? It's your job to defeat monsters like me. If you were an animal, then yes, but you're not that. You're our friend. No, Mira, you're not a monster. You are sick. You weren't even yourself when you did those things, and we know that. Stop telling us to punish you for something we've already forgiven you for. Mm. Cunning words. We've already called your bluff, Mira. There's no use in pretending anymore. The only person still playing this twisted game of self-destruction is you. And we want no more part of it. We will not sit back and watch you throw away your one chance at salvation. And this is making you angry. Mira, listen to me. Do you believe that your sins are so great that no one, not even heaven itself, could you forgive you? But you're wrong. Good people are often, often driven to do vile things by their fear and despair. But evil deeds alone do not make an evil person. Tell me, if you were truly an irredeemable monster, would your guilt have been so strong as to create an entire world? Would you have gone to such lengths to grant your friends justice, however misguided? No, you're wrong. I... <laughs> I can't believe you guys. After everything I've done to hurt you, to torment you all in this tower, you're still trying to save me. Have you ever thought that maybe I don't want to be saved? That I don't want your forgiveness? All I want is the punishment I deserve. If I'm going anywhere, it'll be straight to hell where I belong. Mira appears. Looks like we're in for another fight. But do you really think that we will just simply do what you want us to do? Not once. It's like a remix of the um, main menu. Come now. You're starting to break down. That is what we want. For you to stop this heresy of yours. Please. 
And then provoke Sigurd. I wonder what it would have been like for the other characters. There's definitely four different variations to the story. I don't think that there could be a vari variation where none of the characters are cursed. Because it would be almost impossible to avoid the Grief Eaters' um, psychological attacks. You've already... Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. You've already done that. Hmm, you're not attacking, though. Let's see. Uh, provoke Sigurd again. Come on now. It'd be best if Lydia just heals us. <laughs> With wild eyes, but you're not attacking. I'm starting to get a little bit worried that she's going to have some sort of very, very powerful attack against us. And I don't like the thought of it, you know. Lovely. Mm. You're no longer angry at us. You no longer have that resolve of yours. What's happened, Mira? Why are you not attacking? Gosh. I should pay more attention to the dialogue. Understand the psychosis of this creature. This person. This is quite heavy. This house is as well. I'm still defensing myself up. Keep going. How? How do you expect me to spend an eternity like this, knowing what I've done, living with this guilt? We've all had our guilts, Ruby. But you're the only one who succumbed to your guilt. Uh, yoinkers! Yeah, no thanks. Um, recover, please. That's a lot of damage. Uh, provoke Sigurd again. That's not enough! Lovely. Good. And again. You're only going to attack once? That's very unlike you. Hmm. This is starting to work, though. She is crumbling. And that's what we want. Keep going. Sigurd has been our main attacker for this entire game. Ah, uh, Baba, Mama, ah! Uh. Yikes! All that damage, Yoinkers! How the hell could you do this to us? Um. Which, which one's a revival? Water of Life. Uh, well, it can't be you, uh, because you have to keep on attacking. Edric, you perform... Uh, you perf Okay, Water of Life. I just was so surprised by that attack. Provoke Sigurd again. There. 
keep going. Heal yourself. Hmm. Heal yourself. Nature's blessing. Then miracle medicine on Lydia. And provoke Sigurd again. Good. Lovely. Still not there. <laughs> That's right. Make me pay. Make me pay for everything I've done. Why are you like this? Oh, we know Sigurd is the slowest. Um, so I'm going to perform that on you. Oh, sheesh, I forgot about this. Um, Randy Cry, Randy Cry. <laughs> um, gosh, Water of Life. We're still not leveled up enough for this. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I think those attacks are just meant to be deadly. Um... You perform that on Edwick. Good. Come on. We're nearly there. Don't attack. You... You earthen barrier yourself. You do a miracle medicine her. And you provoke Lydia this time around. It could still be a very long battle. Good. The party's victorious. Don't think we're victorious. Yeah. <laughs> we're not laughing. Mira. <laughs> Some villain I am. Even when I'm trying to make you hate me, I can't, can I? No, Mira. You can't make them hate you. Your bond with your friends is such that it can never be broken, even by unspeakable tragedy. The time has come to end this charade. Your love for your friends and their love for you can no longer be denied. You believe that punishment would save your soul from guilt, but there was always another way. Release the seal upon Toravira, release the souls of your precious friends, and together we can all help you heal from your suffering. I, I. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I. What? Where? There. The seal is gone. It isn't much, but it is like you guys can leave now. Mira? I should have known. I should have known my plan wouldn't work. Even that night, when I killed you, you had only been trying to help me. You cared so much for me, and all I ever did was hurt you for it. I beg to give differ. What you did was horrible, but before that night, you'd done more for us than I think you realize. That's right. You made us smile. You made us happy. You made us laugh. You always brought us joy, even amidst your own fears and insecurities. And now, we can go back to the way it was before. We can all be together in heaven as friends once again. Come on, Ruby. Hold on. Mira, you're... You're coming with us, aren't you? <laughs> As if a sorry sight like me could ever even get close to heaven. 
You guys have all earned your freedom. You fought your battles. You have overcome your traumas and tragic backstories. But I haven't. Not by a long shot. And because of that, I'm pretty much doomed to be a prisoner of this tower. What? No! Are you saying you can't come to heaven with us? Wait, you can't? You can't? We worked way too hard to save you! No. Mira? Hang on, Mira. There has to be a way. There has to be. You stubborn fool. Let us help you. You... Sorry, Pete. It's out of my hands now. Ironic, isn't it? I tried to control Toravira, and now Toravira is one controlling me. But it doesn't have to control you anymore. You can move on. You can all find peace in heaven without me. But we don't want this. It's alright, everyone. Your friend may not be ready to join you now. Perhaps one day she will be. What? What do you mean, Amatella? It is as she said. She may not yet be able to overcome her despair the way you have. As such, she cannot enter the gates of heaven, nor can you force her to. But that doesn't mean she will be trapped here forever. Once she, too, has faced her demons and conquered them, she will be able to join you all in paradise. And I have every confidence that she will, thanks to the love and forgiveness of her friends. The time has come. I will now open the gates of heaven. Take all the time you need to say goodbye, but take heart that it will not be forever. What? We're... We're ourselves again. Yes, these are your true selves, the way you are always meant to be. I... I'm sorry, Mira. I really hoped we'd be able to bring you with us. But I'll try not to worry. If you are strong enough to realize you were wrong to try and change, then I think you'll be strong enough to find your way back. Just try not to keep us waiting too long, okay? Oh, Mira. I wish you didn't have to, have to be this way. I'll pray every single day for your safety, for your freedom from this place. So please, try to be strong for us. Mira, you made a terrible mistake, one that costs all of us dearly, but even so, I hope you can find your way out of this guilt. I know all too well how it feels to hate yourself. Good luck. I'll be waiting for you on the other side. Alright, I'll see you guys later then. I really don't deserve friends as great as you, do I? Goodbye, Mira. May we meet again someday, and may the bonds of your friendship keep, your strong, keep you strong on your journey towards paradise. Now come, children of heaven. Your eternity awaits. I didn't feel like we got a good ending there. I thought a good ending would have come along if we defeated Ruby and did all of that regardless. I thought the bad ending would occur if we just simply lost to Ruby. But there was something we didn't do. Something we didn't perform. A task we didn't complete. But that was a wonderful game nonetheless. Ah, Well, it looks quite heavenly. Ah. 
I don't know. Title and any artwork? Nah. <laughs> Character artwork. Like, the developer went all out in this game in comparison to Prime Dreams, which were default RPG Maker graphics. But this just took an extra level. <laughs> but in both games, the soundtracks were original. Sigurd. Sound effects and samples. I like watching credits. Seeing all the people and... Um, uh, music bands, companies, groups that all contributed towards the game. But tile sets every bit of visual possible. And this all derived from the imagination of a board game, an idea of that tabletop board game. I think that's how. The idea of a celestial tower came into place, and all the memories conglomerated into one tower, a heavenly tower. And maybe the, even, the angel itself was part of their imagination somehow, deep within the recesses of their minds, all four of them. And Ruby, Mira. They all have different origins as well. One Arabic, one uh, Afro slash Caribbean, <coughs> another one from possibly Asia, then Ryan possibly British or European. A lot of diversity there. But they all have one thing in common they are good people. Even if you don't think so, special thanks. Silver theme, Texas Noir, Nacho Power, <laughs> that's a good name, DJJ6870, sorry, Finley Rosaline, Pollinator Gator, Justian, don't know how to pronounce his name, Z Makes Games, Aiden Mechie, Webster, and you. Aww, that's always nice to see an and you part on the special credits. Was that a good ending? Was that the bad ending? I don't know. I wish we get the good ending. But it didn't feel like we saved Mira. Mira. Mirror. God, it's like this darkness never ends. How long have I been wandering around in here anyway? Good. I... I can't. I can't do this anymore. The angel said there'd be a way to end this pain, this guilt. So, what is it, damn it? How the hell am I supposed to forgive myself for this? How am I ever going to get to see my friends again? What? The... Do not despair, Mirror. There is indeed a way. Heaven will never abandon a soul in need of guidance. Wait a second. Isn't that... I'm not controlling it. Open your heart, my child. Open your eyes to the light of truth and let it guide your path. 
Your journey towards salvation is just the beginning. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The book of John. Is that it? Why are we stuck here? Um, oh, it's just fading out now. Cool. Ooh. Oh. Ah, congratulations on Binti to a view of a celestial tower. Thank you so much for playing, and I hope you enjoyed the game. This is the developer's room, a little corner of the fourth wall where you can chat up the characters, read bios and notes, and listen to music. You can even meet the game's, game's artists and see their work in the art gallery. It's highly recommended that you create an extra save while you explore, as you probably don't want to erase those temp... temp it's been over a day. It's been over 24 hours. <laughs> it's not 10 hours, it's 24 hours. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> uh, of hard work, you did getting those poor kids to heaven. Enjoy yourself, and thanks again for playing. QZ Productions. Now, it's definitely more than 10 hours. I cannot say that it's been 10 hours. 10 plus hours, yes, but I would say 20 plus hours is for more realistic approach to, the, to all this. Francis, what would you like to do? I would love to pet Francis, no. Oh, is it did? I hope we could get some information from Francis. Hmm, like a little bar here. What are you looking at? Can't you see I'm busy drinking away my sorrows over here? What's that? You'd like to join me? Okay, I'll bite. Just a warning though, I still got a knife and I can't be held responsible for what I'll do when I'm drunk. What would you like to do? I would like to talk to Ruby, please. Why do I want to be punished, you ask? Good question. I need to put on the fan, it's really warm in here. I guess I have either... So I guess I either have crippling unresolved guilt over what I did to the others, or I'm just a pervert with a masochist streak. I'll let you decide which one is true. Maybe just a conglomeration of both. You again? <laughs> and here I thought I'd scared you away. You can't scare me away. Ruby's Ruby's bio. Hmm. Ruby, age 20, class thief, weapon bow, hobbies. Flirting with women and cooking. A cheeky, free spirited thief who tries to utilize her questionable talents for good. Often described as equal parts fun loving and insufferable, Ruby has a reputation for womanizing, crude humor, and other salacious activities, sorry, particularly while intoxicated. While she can be quick to anger, rush to act, and slow to trust others, those who have earned her friendship state that she has a good heart, often using her boisterous personality and sense of humor to cheer on the people she cares about. Without any memory of her potentially criminal past, Ruby decided to take advantage of her thieving skills by taking back stolen goods to their rightful owners and stopping less grumpless bandits in their tracks. Along the way, she meets the others who, despite their reservations about her occupation, soon accepts her as a part of their group. After coming to trust her new friends, she decides to join them on their journey up the legendary Celestial Tower, hoping not only to gain riches and bragging rights, but also to rid the world of the evil known as the Dark One. After receiving a vision of the second Spring of Truth, however, Ruby begins to spiral down a dark path of villainy. In her previous life as Mira, she suffered a, psycho oh, sorry, a psychotic break after the death of her father, which she erroneously believed that her friends Ryan, Melissa and Peter were involved with. This culminated in the devastating murder of all three, followed by her own suicide upon realizing what she had done. With her last breath, 
she unintentionally set into motion the creation of their world, trapping the souls of her and her friends in the process. As the Dark One, Ruby appears to have lost all love for her comrades, engage in sadistic and manical behaviour towards them. She alludes to herself as an unforgivable monster, using cruel words and acts of violence to prove her point. However, the others quickly see through this act, and they eventually realise her true intentions to gauge the group into punishing her for the crimes she commits in life. In the good ending, it is only after realising the futility of her plans that she relents, releasing Toravira's seal and allowing the others to ascend to heaven. She is then left behind to wander, searching for a way out of her despair and towards her eventual redemption. So we did get the good ending after all. Because I believe we didn't, if we didn't get the good ending, then we wouldn't get this developer's room. Hey, uh, welcome to Amy's Amazing Bar Adventuring Booze, where every hour is happy hour. Hehe, <laughs> just kidding. This is actually the developer's room. Or at least a part of it. You can also head outside to the park or the art gallery if you like. But would you be interested in the ale special? It's all you can drink for a low, low price. What would you like to do? Hold on, I need something else. Well, thanks for stopping by, come back to blah, blah, blah. I forgot to look at redeveloper's notes. It's the resident vodka aunt and the four gods gift to women everywhere. <laughs> or rather, that's what she'd like to believe anyway. To be fair, though, she's got a good reason to be cocky prior to the game's full release. She was by far the most popular of the main four characters. Guess she's quite the charmer after all. I think her villain Rude is the most interesting of all the main characters. While she is outwardly the most dangerous and sadistic, in reality she carries the most guilt over what she's done. Her stubborn attempts to maintain a psychopathic facade are as scary as they are kind of pitiful. Oh well, at least she tried her best, right? At the very least, she definitely has the award for the scariest villain faces, needless to say. I had a small heart attack when I first opened up the .psd file. It's Photoshop file, by the way. Laugh my ass off. Okay, that's what I wanted to read before going here. Yay, you're back! Did you need something? I would like to talk to Amy. You probably already guessed as much, but this isn't my real personality. The whole cheeky little girl shtick is all just part of my disguise. But just because it's an act doesn't mean I can't have fun with it, right? <laughs> I would like to also read Amy's bio. Age unknown, class merchant, Weapon none, hobbies, making money and playing with Francis. A peculiar young girl with an applicable business sense and mysterious goals in ways unknown. She manages to make her way into Toro Vero, supposedly to set up her new storefront. While inside she is attacked by monsters only to be rescued by Sigurd, Lydia, Edric and Ruby. The Blind Ruby. To express her gratitude, Amy offers the group exclusive access to her adventuring goods, which ranges from weapons to armor and everything in between. Although grateful for this little girl's help, the party begins to grow curious about her origins, and even slightly suspicious of her motives for helping them. As the group continue to encounter Amy and her sales assistant, a dog named Francis, on subsequent floors of the tower, they begin to suspect that she knows more about the tower and themselves than they realise. Though she is typically very chipper and eager to give a sales pitch, she also has rare moments of wisdom far beyond her apparent age. Once the party receives their vision at the second spring of truths, she drops her childlike facade and she eventually rescues the group from the clutches of the tower guardians. 
leaving them wondering just what kind of power the so-called merchant actually possesses. Ah, that's the end of that form. Fireplace, no. Sigurd. Oh, hey, I was so busy playing that I almost didn't notice you. <laughs> Congratulations on beating the game, by the way. You got us through the tower in one piece. That's quite the accomplishment. Though, to be honest, does it really count as one piece if we were dead from the beginning? Uh, never mind. Maybe I shouldn't think too hard about it. What would you like to do? Talk to Sigurd. Every hero's journey ends with a valuable lesson learned. And I know my lesson out of all of this. Is that cancer really, really, really sucks. That's probably the most truthful thing that, you, that anyone's ever said, Sigurd. Hand on my heart that that truly, awfully sucks. You're back. Was there something you needed? Um, read Sigurd's bio. Sigurd, age 21, class knight, weapon sword. Hobbies, playing the Delcoma, encouraging his friends as well. A kind-hearted knight who once served a great kingdom. Known for his compassionate spirit and bravery, Sigurd has a so, tendency to want to help anyone who's in trouble, even on occasions where it would be foolish or reckless to do so. His heroic nature and boyish charm make him easy to get along with, not to mention popular with women. But these same qualities also result in a rather naive outlook on life and a black and white view on, of good and evil. After losing all of his memories, save for his name and former occupation, Sigurd became a wandering mercen mercen mer mercenary. Sorry. Though he often rejected payment for his services out of a sense of justice, eventually he would encounter Lydia, Edric and Ruby, and together they would band together to fight the evils brought forth by the Dark One under the banner of the Heroes of Justice, though only he ever really used his name. In fact, it was Sigurd himself who originally proposed journeying to the Celestial Tower to Aviro in hopes of stopping the world corruption at its source. Upon climbing the tower, Sigurd eventually comes face to face with the truth of his past identity, a frail, sickly college student named Ryan Elliot, who used fantasy games as a way to escape the pain and trauma of his cancer. Cancer really, really, really sucks. Although he is initially distraught at the idea of his current form, being nothing but an idolised false identity, he eventually comes to terms with his suffering and he vows to use the opportunities his healthier body can give him to free his and his friend's souls from Toravira's grip, including the soul of his fallen comrade, the Dark One. Ouchies. There's one more thing I need to read, actually. Um, read developer's notes of Sigurd. The eldest of the heroes of Justin's, as you've probably already guessed, Sigurd is supposed to be an archetypical RPG hero with a little bit of personal taste thrown into his design. Read, I made him hot on purpose. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> You're not sorry. You're totally not sorry. You made him handsome and young and lovely to use in battle. So as not to make him too generic, however, I gave him a talent I didn't think I've seen in a game character before. Playing the Dulcimer. Or more specifically, a mountain Dokima. This also resulted in the creation of the Sigurd's Dokima tracks, which were a lot of fun to compose. I don't know if it actually corresponds with the way you'd play a mountain Dokima, but hey. Hey, it is what it is, you know. It just played out the way it did. Okay, let's move on. Also, in the original versions of his bus artwork, his chin stubble was far less noticeable. In fact, it was one of the main things the artist wanted to tweak for the final game, and I, for one, am glad she did. You can never make a beard too manly, after all. 
Okay, I wish I didn't shave my beard now, thanks. <laughs> it was almost it was almost like this line was made for me to get to this point and think a few days prior to recording this that I should shave my beard. Thanks, Lydia. Why, hello there. I want to thank you for your efforts to help free us from Toro Vero. We truly couldn't have done it without you. You're welcome to a cup of tea if you'd like. It's my signature blend of mint and lemongrass. And if you don't like mint, well, I suppose I can brew something else. Um... I can't think of anything that I would like mint in, so it's too... I don't know, it just has that taste which I really don't like. Although, I would happily eat it over something like coconuts. Talk to Lydia. I've been thinking lately about how much I miss her. The old Ruby. I miss the way she made us smile. The way she always encouraged us. I even find myself missing her dirty jokes from time to time. Just miss her indefinitely. Would you like some more tea? I'm not a fan of tea. I'm a coffee person, really. Read Lydia's bio. Age 18. Class Druid, Weapon Staff, Hobbies, Collecting Flowers and Tea Brewing. A kind motherly forest elf with a strong connection to nature. As a druid healer, she is described as very warm and dotting her well dotting towards others, particularly her friends. In fact, she would say that she can be overbearing with her affection at times. She is deeply spiritual, often relying on her faith in the four gods of guidance. And she is often the one to try and make peace within the party whenever there's a conflict. Despite this, she is often quite anxious due to her phobia of fire and fears of losing her friends. Lydia spent her days after losing her memory searching for her lost elven tribe, providing aid to the sick and injured during her travels. She eventually joined Sigurd, Edric and Ruby on their quest to rid the world of the Dark One's influence and she formed a strong familial bond with them, almost instantly. Despite the overwhelming odds, she resolved to join her comrades on her journey up the Celestial Tower, providing healing and comfort whenever she could. While scaling to a Vero, Lydia's memories of her past life are restored. As a child, Melissa accidentally caused a house fire, resulting in the deaths of her mother, father and infant brother. As she grew up, she began to fill the lonely holes in her heart with the friendship she made with the others in their tabletop gaming group. Though her guilt and insecurities continue to haunt her throughout the group's journey, she soon decides that she has punished herself enough for her childhood mistakes, resolving to free herself from her despair and meet her beloved family once again in heaven. Good on ya. While I'd like to meet you the third time so I can read your developer's notes. The squishy healer and team mom ex extraordinaire, sorry. Speaking of which, early on during development when the game was released, a streamer started calling her Elf Mom, <laughs> and the nickname struck to this day. I don't think I did that. From a design standpoint, I think she was my favorite to create. I was really proud of her outfit and her hair accessories in particular. Giant dingling balls. Why not? I haven't even noticed that until you said that actually. I do have to admit though, that a lot of traits I gave to elves in general were just abilities. I pulled out my butt as I need to for plot purposes. For instance, her ability to sense living beings came from a need to provide an in-universe warning for impending boss fights. I've also had people ask me how she remained so oblivious to Edric's feelings for her despite being quite intelligent. Well, the answer to that is a combination of her own self-esteem issues and just being kind of naive about love in general. Hashtag relatable, am I right? Oh, and one final tip for those who want to replay the game. You'll have a much easier time if you give her the Purity Seal. That way she won't be incapacitated when, you're, when your other party members need healing from status ailments. Thanks. We only get one of those on our journey when 
until we get to Francis on the final time when we meet Francis. Edric! My apologies, I didn't see you standing there. I suppose congratulations are in order for completing the game with the best ending, relatively speaking. Though I admit that a bittersweet ending is vastly preferable to the alternative. The alternative would be the total destruction of everyone. Except Ruby, obviously. Talk to Edric. For more I think about it, the less sense certain parts of our journey make. For instance, in the first floor, there was a fence that blocked our path, a wooden fence to be precise. Surely I would have been able to burn through such an obstacle were it not for our developer's laziness. <laughs> oh, that's a bit fourth wall, don't you think? Hello again, did you forget something? No, I didn't. I wanted to see your bio. Edwig, age 19, class mage, weapon tome, hobby, studying magic and drawing. A prodigy mage who studied his craft at a prestigious magical university. At first glance, so it's a bit like Hogwarts. But again, looking at him, he does seem like a Harry Potter figure, doesn't he? <laughs> at first, even his design bit looks very, very Harry Potterish. but don't tell the developer that. At first glance, he appears to be a prickly, standoffish individual with limited patience and a sharp, sarcastic tongue. However, much of his coldness towards others is simply a result of his inability to express his emotions. Those who can look past his snide remarks often describe him as noble-hearted and loyal to his comrades, using his intellect and pragmatism to assist them in their battles against the Dark One's forces. He is also something of a closeted romantic, if his suppressed feelings for Lydia are anything to go by. While searching for clues as to his forgetting identity, Edric meets up with Sigurd, Lydia and Ruby and decides that his talents would be best suited to fighting evil alongside them. Although he was initially hesitant over taking on such a daunting task, he eventually agreed to help them scale to a mirror, the Celestial Tower, in the hopes of ending the Dark One's reign of terror and, he presumed, to keep Sigurd and Ruby from doing anything too rash. Upon discovering his true name in the heart of Toraviro, Edric remembers his past life as a timid, anxious young boy named Peter Choi. For his life he had been torn down constantly by the belittling words of his alcoholic mother, and he struggled extensively with depression as a result. He had bonded with his friends over a shared interest in tabletop games, and eventually fell in love with Lydia's past self, Melissa, whose kind words helped him through his dark force, determined to no longer let the lies of his mother control him. Edward makes an effort to become more confident and self-assured, summoning the courage he needs to save not only his soul, but those of his loved ones as well. And one more thing. The developer's notes. My grumpy mage son, if I'm going to be 100% honest, I think Edric here is my favourite character in the entire game. I mean, I love the whole squad, but I just have a theme for... Oh, okay. Um, for people with love issues and magical powers, apparently. Some things about his design that I like to think stand out are his red eyes, which I thought were a nice contrast to his blue colour scheme, and his cap fastener, which is essentially a bow, bolo tie. You mean a bow tie? Bolo tie? Le Mal! Something you ought to know for future playthroughs, if we didn't discover it already. Ah, there is actually a way to get Edric and Lydia together as a couple, but only on specific routes and only if you make them talk to each other a lot. So, what the developer is saying here is that every time we go to a campfire and we can have conversations with each other, there are two conditions. Number one is that either Edric and Lydia do not fall to darkness, so in this case, only Sigurd or Ruby can fall into darkness. And number two, Every time we have a campfire conversation, one of the three is between Edric and Lydia. 
Edric and Lily Lilia of <laughs> Away with Words. There's also an in battle bonus that may trigger once you've fulfilled the requirements. But that sorry, but that my friends will remain a secret for you to discover yourselves. I'm not replaying another 24 hours to get to that point, but I will come back to this game at some point in my life. <laughs> just not right now, okay? Just not right now, just discover that bit. Hmm. But do I do applaud the um the interest within that. Let's see. What do I want to do next? I want to go this way, please. Head towards the park? Absolutely. What is... Why are you here? Of all places, Kyle Mason. I know that. Can we go back? No. Okay, good. Why are you here? <sighs> you know, all I wanted was to enjoy my time as a retired protagonist, but no, I'm apparently contradictory obligated to make a camo in this game too. Ugh, anyway, if you enjoy Toravera and art for something a little more traditional in its horror, you may want to check out QT Productions' first game, Prom Dreams, a high school love story. I recommend that, by the way. It's available whenever you download this download this game from. It's available whenever you can download this game. Can I go home now? Uh. <laughs> Seriously, I'm gonna have to have words with my developer. Does she really think I'll be okay with shitting out my own suffering as a form of entertainment? Is she out of her mind? <laughs> Uh, that's not going to be the, the case, man. Uh, a slide, sure, it looks normal, but touch it. Oh my god, it's you from Living Playground. Yeah, you found me. My name's Tony, I'm a slide, but I'm a kid sometimes too. We're from Mika's games, Living Playground and Living Playground 2, the Witch's Puppet. They're really fun, so check them out too, okay? Just um, don't tell a developer that we're here. We're not supposed to one run in other people's games. So this is kind of like... Uh, Wreck-It Ralph. You're not supposed to be in other games, but you are. And you... Monkey bars. But look a bit off. And you're one of the other two children. <laughs> but you didn't expect that to happen. I did, actually, because I've played both of the games. The name's Octavio. I'm here to find snails and keep my little brother and sister out of trouble. Oh, it looks like you've already met Tony, at least. Well, if you ever need a, a play to place, a place to place, so we're all right here. Even though we're not supposed to be. We're kind of supposed to be, okay. Fine, we'll be on our way then. And swings. A swing, something seems a bit strange about it. We'll touch it. And you. Hey, what kind of weirdo goes along poking swing checks? At least play on it or something. Anyway, I'm Pablo. I'm the cool brother of the Living Playground games. Oh man, Tony Octavio already told you about our games. But I wanted to be the first, but I mean jerks. Well, you enjoy being here with your little cameo here. Mika will surely be delighted. Right, are there any other cameos I'm supposed to be aware of? Other games that I played in the past? Like, um, I don't know. Something from Z Make Games, something from Immortal, or the Clockwork Prince. Welcome, I do hope you enjoy yourself here in the developer's room. If you'd like to chat, chat with any of the game's characters, feel free to do so. I know they're all eager to thank you for your help. Well, all except one, perhaps. What would you like to do? Talk to Amatel. Why wasn't I able to use the full extent of my angelic powers, you ask? Well, I suppose it all boils down to my kind's duty to abide by the laws and logic of a world in which we do work our, sorry, we do our work. But I suppose that duty ultimately stems from our developer needing a way to keep me from being overpowered. Uh, wait, are there multiple conversations? Huh? You think I'm 
Out of place? Well, yes, I suppose my current form does stand out a bit when compared to the others. <laughs> Is there anything else? I suppose it's randomised. It picked between a bank of different things. Oh! I feel as though I'm obligated to warn you. Should you decide to play through the game again, be cautious of the choices you make and be particularly wary of the Grief Eater's attacks. Not that you will be able to prevent the Dark One's despair entirely, but at the very least, you may have some control over whose route you obtain. That's like a spoiler. In a way. Hmm. How many others are there? Uh, is it just three different ones? Maybe that's it. Ah, age timeless. Angel varies. Yeah, uh, it varies depending on the character. Obscuring and guiding humankind and playing with Francis. The angel of truth and heaven's immersionary to the world of the four gods. After discarding her disguise, Emma Tell is revealed to be a noble, wise being of incredible power. Through these powers are bound by the limitations set by the world she has infiltrated. While her current form alternates between that of a young elven girl and a grown woman, she can in fact assume the form of any age, gender, or species deemed suitable to her work. Upon orders from a higher power, her mission was to locate the wandering spirits of Ryan, Elliot, Melissa, Peter, and sorry, Ryan, Melissa, Peter, and Miriam, in order to guide them towards the truth of their fates. Then, once we have learned and accepted this truth, she was to lead the four to the gates of heaven, where they will finally be able to enter paradise. In order to do this, however, she had to abide by the rules and laws of the fantasy world, and so, with the help of her fellow angelic being, Francis, she assumed the disguise of a stereotypical RPG merchant, using not only her good and war wares, but also her gentle guidance to help the party find the truth they were seeking. However, this gentle guidance would not entirely go as planned. While she had intended for the truth to be revealed to the group gradually, allowing them time to process and accept it, it is all too much to bear for the soul of Myra Arazi, reincarnated as the thief Ruby. After remembering her terrible deeds, she begins to act cruel and psychotic, all in an attempt to convince the others of the monster she'd become. Then she takes control to a bill of herself, and Avatar is left with no choice but to intervene directly, rescuing Sigurd, Lydia, and Edric from the Tower Guardians and urging them to seek out the keys to their former identities, their true names. Once the remaining party members remember their past selves, Amatel reveals her true identity and intentions, apologizing to them for her earlier deception after explaining that it is indeed up to them to save their fallen friend from her madness. She offers to join them in combat for the remainder of the journey. In the end, after many long and half-fought battles, Amatel and the others finally convince Ruby to end her villainous act and release the seal upon the tower. Unfortunately, due to her unresolved guilt, pain and suffering, she would not be able to enter the gates of heaven as they had hoped, but Amatel reassures that all that, one day, she too will overcome her despair and join her friends in paradise. One day. But because you did that, I'm going to go back to the other four and see if they've got any other lines. Um, let's see. Talk. Why do I want to be punished, you ask? Good question. I guess I... Okay. That. Um, any others? No. I'm sure you have more lines than this. Go away, fly. I'm sure you have more lines than this. How about I let you in on a little secret? I'm not the only one who can become a villain in the game. Maybe when you play through it again and make different choices, you'll see what I mean. Do you have a third choice? Um, no. That's not it. I have no idea what the others are talking about. My crazy villain impression is perfect. <laughs> well, you're scared yet? No, I'm not scared yet. Hmm. 
sometimes I just think you are the biggest of it around. Uh, have you got anything else to offer? Um, I think Amatel had only three. Mm, I think we'll end it off with that one. <laughs> Lovely. Any others? Talk to Lydia. What's that? Why am I drinking in a pub? Drinking tea in a pub? Well, to be frank, someone has to remain sober enough to ensure Ruby doesn't do anything foolish. Um... Any others? I've been thinking lately about how much I miss her. The old, okay, we've already seen this one. <laughs> They're daddy jokes. The village of undead we went through. Oh, I hope I never have to go through such a place ever again. Apparently, surprise horror elements are a common theme amongst our developers' games. They are indeed. That wasn't the only undead looking place. Dolores, I'm looking at you. Hello again, did you forget something? Have you got any other conversations to offer up? I'm going to be honest. I'm not sure how comfortable I am with Ruby drinking after all that's happened. Her drunken antics are one thing, but to add paranoia and psychosis to the mix. Yeah, it's a concoction for a demise. The more I think about it, the less sense certain parts of our journey make. For instance, in, okay, we've already done this one. Any others? Wooden fence, Ruby. What? what? A date? I, I have no idea what you're talking about. Just because we're having tea at the ta same table doesn't mean it's a date. God's almighty. <laughs> Damn it. I would like to see if there's anything else you have. Okay. Yep. Talk. Seriously, did Ruby actually think anyone would buy her heartless evil villain act? We're talking about a woman who plays with puppies and lives off of bad puns. The same woman who steals roses from table vases to give to cute cows. And she really expected us to believe that she was some kind of bloodthirsty psychopath. Yeez. And just looking while we're here. Request a different song? Sure thing. What song would you like me to play? Let's see. Um, while we're going through this, oh, the labyrinth, the labyrinth. Hmm. The tower summit, maybe. Confrontation. The heart of suffering. The skin of despair. I don't know. Out of all these, what do I want to play? We'll stick with that one. I think that's been my personal favourite theme out of all of them, but all of them have a special place. Apparently it only applies to the pub. Ah, oh, you're here, that's why. Damn it. Oh, there you are. I'm so glad you came to visit us. It's nice to be able to meet the person who helped us all to get to her room. I know for you it was just a game, but it really means a lot to us. But if it hadn't been for the fourth wall, we could have expressed our gratitude a lot sooner. What would you like to do? Talk to Melissa. In hindsight, I probably should have given Lilia more boost to her consultation while I had a chance in life. Maybe then you would have had no trouble keeping her alive. I rarely had that problem. I think everyone was targeting Ruby and that's why Ruby was the way she was. Uh, in all honesty though, I barely had any trouble keeping any of the characters, well, in trouble of being dead. Talk to Melissa. It still gives me chills thinking about what, what Mira did that night. The way she looked at us with those empty wild eyes. Why did the artist have to draw her so frightening? To make her that look more all sadistic and evil. Go away, fly. Get off my monitor. 
Whenever you see me just like going like that, it's because I fly is on my monitor. Talk to Melissa. Uh, that one, I think it's just three different conversations. One of the good things to come out of all of this is that I'll get to see my family again. Even if it will have to be off screen since our developer didn't bother to make proper spikes for them. I don't think that's the case at all. Melissa's bio. Age 18, occupation college student. Hobbies, reading fantasy novels, growing flowers. And favourite food, teas and pastry. Favourite hobbies, no favourite food. Whichever the case is. A kind and soft-spoken young woman with a penchant for gardening and tea making. While her warm hospitality and innocent demeanor make her easy to get along with, in truth she's somewhat of a lonely soul. However, towards the few friends she has made, she can be extremely dotting as a result. When Melissa was five, her caring and giving nature got the better of her, with disastrous consequences. While attempting to imitate her mother and cook breakfast for her family, she accidentally started a massive house fire which killed her mother, father and infant brother. The incident left her with an intense phobia of fire and extreme survivor's guilt. She also began to withdraw from others out of fear of hurting them the way she believed she had hurt her family. As a young adult, Melissa sought solace in her religious faith and escaped from her stress in the form of fantasy stories. Eventually, in an attempt to convince her out her come out in an attempt, eventually, in an attempt to come out of her shell, she enrolled in the community college, where she would stumble upon her second family, so to speak, Ryan, Peter, and Mira. Together, the three taught Melissa how to play a popular tabletop. RPG, The Celestial Tower, and through the game sessions of friendship she felt the holes left behind and her heart finally began to heal. Sadly her new fond friendship with the others would also lead to her tragic death. Upon learning that her friend Mira's father had shot himself, she and the others responded with condolences and attempts to give her time to recover. However, she began to suspect that keeping their distance had been a mistake, and the group eventually went to check up on her. There, they encountered an awful sight. But a house in shambles, crazed conspir conspiritual writings of Mira, who began interrogating them under the delusional belief that they had something to do with her father's death. Melissa was suddenly taken hostage by her friend, watching horror as she killed Peter for attempting to save her. Then, while she began to beg for mercy, she too found herself at the end of Mira's knife, dying in a pool of her own blood. Yikes. Sorry, I need to blow my nose quick. And we are back. Hello, folks. I would like to read the developer's notes on Melissa. Lydia's true self and a good Christian girl, TM, who never did anything wrong in her life, except kill her family, I guess, by accident. 100% accident. Oh gosh, my, my glasses are done that as a result of... No, sorry folks. People with glasses are always mistaken as nerds. And there's probably a good reason why sometimes that we are quite cross at least once a day. We're always wiping our lenses, that's why. For real though, I did want her religious faith to be a positive aspect of her personality yet, yeah, because she kept referring to before gods as like a beacon of sorts. Partially because it fits the game's theme of redemption, but also because I wanted to show a religious character who was friends with people very different from herself. It also helps a lot with her girl next door appeal, which suits as a basis of for Lilia's gentle, innocent personality within the fantasy world. Of all the real world character portraits, I honestly think Melissa's turned out to be the prettiest. Ah, I was afraid the concept would be a bit bland when fleshed out, especially the outfit, but she tu actually turned out super cute. Massive kudos to the artist for her work. I knew I wouldn't have had the skill to make her so stinking adorable. Nah. With enough patience and persistence, you'll be able to get there one day, QZ. And with enough patience and persistence, I'll be able to get these damn bugs off my screen. 
Uh, and Peter, er, hey there. Uh, I mean, sorry if it seems like I'm not grateful for your help. I really am. I'm just, you know, not very good at expressing them myself. Time and time again, we've noticed that. But don't worry, we accept you for who you are, Peter. Edwick. I guess in hindsight, it was a pretty stupid and to try and rush mirror the way I did. So much for being the smart character in this game. Yeah, you died first. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, so uh, what brings you back here anyway? I would like to talk to you again. Um, another one. Another one. A another one. Come on. You've got other conversations. If you feel about... So if you feel bad about what happened between my mum and I, don't. What's past is past. I'll get over it someday. After all, in the end, I was a main character and she was just an NPC. That's got to count for something, right? Right? Any other conversations? Um, nope. Any others? Nope. Hmm. <laughs> You got that kind of similar smug that Ruby has. Look, I only designed our characters in universe for the purposes of for a plot. I didn't actually design them. So if you want someone to blame for Edric's weird bow tie thing, blame our developer, not me. <laughs> Dear developer, I'm blaming you. Uh, you got any other conversations, young man? Any others? Any others? Come on, Kyle. You can do this. You can do this, Kyle. Kyle. Kyle, I know you can do this. <laughs> I believe in you, Kyle. You can do this. After all you've been through, come on. You can do this. You're, in pe you're at peace now. You are definitely at peace, okay? If you've got anything to say, anything at all, please, Kyle. I'm begging you, Kyle. Please, Kyle. <laughs> Gosh. Uh, hello there, Ryan. Hello there, nice day out, huh? Makes me almost forget that we were fighting our friend over the fate of our souls just a few minutes ago. Wait a second. If we just went through the gates of heaven, does that mean that heaven is actually a developer's room? Good question. Now I'm confused. Maybe this is the little bit in between... The dream world and heaven were in the developer's room. Talk to Ryan. I always knew Mira wasn't a bad person at heart, but I'm still glad I was proven right in the end. She was just, you know, crazy and homicidal. Temporarily. You? Any others? Sorry if my true self is a bit disappointed to see... Cancer and chemo can really do a number on your body, after all. Though I guess it's kind of my own fault for making Sigurd such a beefcake in the first place. Beefcake. Um, have you got anything else? Uh, I don't think I... Did I... No, I don't think I read Peter's bio and stuff like that. Um, any of us? Uh, no, I want to just, I want to get another conversation out of you. I would, an, another one, please. Come on. You can do it. You can do it, Ryan. Come on, me. You can do it. Come on, Ryan. Like, no, no, no. That's not for one. I didn't want that one. I wanted the other one, which you haven't played yet. Come on, please. You can do this. You, no, not that one. There's another one. There's another one in there somewhere. There is one more in there, please. Please, Ryan. I'm begging you, Ryan. But, no, not that one. Come on. <laughs> this is a bit random, but this is a bit too um, displaced for my liking. Ah, you know, if we'd known from the beginning that we'd been reborn in an RPG world, we probably would have had a heck of an easier time. We could have gone level grinding, maxed out our stats, optimized our party for maximum damage output. <laughs> oh wait, you're the player, so that was your job, wasn't it? <laughs> Look, Ryan, I tried my best here, okay? I got you to level 30, and we perfectly sailed through the game without any mishaps. 
except after fighting you, uh, uh, except during the battle against Mira, obviously. Okay, so I want to see your bio. Peter Choi. Let's see, age 19, occupation college student, strategy games, drawing and digital art. Black bean sauce and noodles is your favor, huh? Those are nice too. A quiet and gifted young man afflicted by depression and anxiety tendencies. He is often described as a creative spirit, although his shyness and difficulty expressing himself often mask that aspect of himself. He also has a bit of a sarcastic side. However, he's quick to apologize if his snark yeah, if his snark goes too far on offense or offends others. Growing up, Peter was regularly bullied and belittled by his mother, who herself suffered from depression and alcoholism and took her anger out upon his son. As he grew older, the abuse only worsened, as she constantly told Peter how worthless he was to her, instilling a pitiful self-doubt and self-hatred in him. Even after Peter's father had enough and divorced his wife, the scars remained, and in high school, her sought medical attention for his worsening depression and trauma symptoms. Though his father tried his hardest to be supportive, he also seemed to be at a loss for how to best his or best help his son. Well, separate him from the mother would probably be one thing. Thankfully, with treatment, Peter's condition began to somewhat stabilize. Though he was still struggling to live or still struggling in college and in his day to day living. What truly helped him, however, were the friends he had made on campus, Ryan, Mira, and Melissa. Through their tabletop gaming sessions, he found an outlet for his creativity and a reason to keep fighting his mental illness. After hearing news of his mother's death, he opened up to Melissa about his childhood torment, and it was her kind words and unconditional support that caused him to fall in love with her. Though he didn't dare tell her or anyone else for fear of rejection. Ironically, for all his thoughts of dying by his own hand, it was in fact his good friend that would wind up taking his life. One day, Peter's father, a police officer, told him that Mira's father had committed suicide. Wanting to support their friend, he and the others expressed their condolences and offered to give her space. However, after not hearing from her for days, they go to check on her, only to discover that she but she'd had some sort of mental breakdown over the death. It was then that Mira appeared, brandishing a knife and demanding the group confess their involvement. She then took Melissa hostage, threatening her life and causing Peter to fly into a rage in an ill-fated attempt to save Melissa. He charged at Mira, only to be brutally stabbed to death for his efforts. They should say that the smart ones die last because they use their brains. Well, this one did the opposite and would charge forward like Sigrid would. Okay. Developers Knowles. Edric's true form, the king of nerds himself, obeyed a cute nerd, but still. I think the biggest difference between Peter and Edric is their speech patterns. Edwix is very formal and pedantic, while Peter's is a lot more casual, which makes sense, but the switch was a bit tough to get used to as a writer. Peter's self-doubt and insecurities are also a lot more obvious, in that he doesn't try as hard to hide them with a loafedness as Edwix does. Essentially, their personalities differ less in traits and more in how those traits are expressed. When writing about his depression, I didn't want it to be too melodramatic or over-exaggerated, so I had him pursuing treatment with his father at least trying to give him support. In a way, it mirrors the way I experienced depression at one time, while well, I had help, but it still took a while to overcome, though this is all assuming you didn't get Edric's route during the game, where things turn out, well, differently. If you say so. Definitely. I'm guaranteeing that that's going to be a thing. And I'm guaranteeing that this developer's room has four different variations. But I'm not going to get to the other three because that's going to take a huge amount of time to do. Read Ryan's bio. It's taken long enough just to get to one of them, okay? Please forgive me. 
Readwise Buyer. Ryan Elliott, a good natured idealistic young man <clears throat> with a talent for music. He is a college student, plays JRPGs, and plays a guitar. And his favorite food is tacos. Okay. He has always had a heart for helping those who are suffering. Even prior to his illness, perhaps it was this fact that made him idolize heroic archetypes and drew him to stories of chivalry and adventure. At age 17, Ryan was diagnosed with an extremely rare form of bone cancer, Ewing sarcoma, which presented itself in his ribs because the condition was so uncommon in men. The cancer has progressed to stage 3 by the time it was found, warranting drastic treatment measures. This resulted in not only extreme pain and episodes of respiratory distress, but also a very traumatic hospital stay, during which he was never sure whether he would survive. Fortunately, the treatment was a success, and after going into remission, Ryan enrolled in Community College, where he met his friends Melissa, Peter and Mira. He then proposed the idea of forming a tabletop gaming group together, based upon the game The Celestial Tower. His friendship with the others proved not only a much needed escape from his pain and trauma, but also a network of supporting for his outgoing health problems that was caring and understanding. However, his happy recovery would prove to be short-lived, as his death would not come in the form of his cancer, but rather at the hands of his very own friend. One day he and the others learned that Mira's father had committed suicide, unsure of how else to help her, they elected to give her some space, texting their condolences and offers to talk if needed. After several days of not hearing from her, the group decided to go to her house, where they found evidence that she had suffered some kind of psychotic breakdown. It was then that Mira found the group, accused them of being involved with her father's death, and fatally stabbed Peter and Melissa in her rage. In a last-ditch effort to stop the bloodshed, Ryan reached out to her, offering to get her the help she needed. However, this only enraged Mira, causing her to stab him numerous times, killing him instantly. And then finally you. Well, well, look who finally decided to show up. Now that you're here, maybe I can show you why saving me was a bad idea. What's that look supposed to be, pity? Guess I really didn't need to work on my villain act after all. Talk. What's that? Where did I... Where do I hide my knife? Wouldn't you like to know? No, I wouldn't like to know, thank you. It's probably somewhere that I shouldn't look anyways. Oh, uh, you again. What, you have some kind of death wish or something? No, I don't, actually. Talk to Mira. Look, a little acknowledgement of my hard work and practice is all I'm asking. These crazy phases didn't just appear out of nowhere after all. Come on, you've got another one in there. Be kind to me. Look, be kind to me, please. Please, that's all I'm asking for. Be kind to me. I don't need this one. There's another one in there somewhere, please. Please do that, please. Okay, fine, I admit it. I played up the evil factor because I had to, not because I wanted to. That said, it's actually a part of, it's actually pretty horrific going for Yangri or for a while. You should try it sometime. No, I'm good where I am. I'm good with the peace life. I'm good with the sane life, rather the insane life. Read Mira's bio. Uh, Mira. College student, part-time waitress, watching anime, cooking, Japanese-style curry and rice. A spirited, outgoing young woman who usually goes by the nickname Mira. Known for her brash attitude and sense of humor, Mira enjoys putting smiles on the faces of those she cares about. However, she can also be quick to anger and judgment, and she doesn't take kindly to those who she feels has wronged her or her loved ones. Mira was born in a North African country to a family of investigative journalists, an occupation which unfortunately landed them many enemies, including a group of arms seers that had, had ties to local government officials. In retaliation to Mira's father attempting to expose them, they planted a bomb underneath a family's car, killing her mother as they prepared to go to the movies. 
She and her father then fled to America, where they spent the next 15 years moving frequently, all while Mira was constantly warned of the danger that followed them wherever they went. Despite her father's noble intentions, his protectiveness, his protectiveness sorry, also instilled a sense of mistrust in Mira, making it difficult for her to form meaningful relationships. Once she entered college, however, that slowly and surely began to change. There, Mira met her friends Ryan, Peter, and Melissa, and together the four bonded over their shared geeky interests and tabletop role-playing games. For Mira, this provided a much-needed escape from the fear she'd grown accustomed to, as well as a chance to make a significant connection with someone other than her father. Finally, for the first time in years, she began to feel like she could truly open her heart to others. Unfortunately, Mira's trust in her friends would not last. One evening after returning home from work, she found a note near her father's bedroom. Shocked by its contents, she ran inside only to find him dead with a gunshot wound in their shower. The police conducted a sweep of the scene and then concluded based on the evidence that it was most likely a suicide. However, Mira could not bring herself to accept such a thing and she became increasingly convinced that he was murdered by the same people who killed her mother. She became more and more obsessed with this idea. Then, when she received condolences from her friends containing details she thought they couldn't know, she succumbed to her paranoia, concocting a delusion that, somehow, they too were involved. Meanwhile, Ryan, Melissa and Peter became worried about their friend and decided to go to her house to check on her. There, they found manic scrawlings and conspiracy theories strewn across the room. When Mira returned and found them, she branched a knife given to her by her father for protection and began interrogating them. They denied their involvement and Mira responded by taking Melissa hostage. In a bold attempt to save her, Peter tried to risk, so risk the knife away only to be stabbed by Mira. Next she slit Melissa's throat, Ryan then tried one last time to get through to her, offering to get her the help she needed, but it too was in vain. Melissa celebrated her victory, then it was a cruel twist. She realised that Peter's father was a police officer, and that he had given Peter information about the case. Horrified by what she had done, she turned a knife on herself. Was she for either another chance or divine punishment and inadvertently creating to her Vera in the process? I knew that from the very beginning that this was somehow a, an alternative an alternate an alternative world in which we would go through a sequence of events and then we find out that these four heroes that we were playing as are just four people within the real world and one of them because it says the dark one it was going to come to a point where one of these four characters would then turn evil and then inadvertently created this process in the first place but for one who created it was not obvious until one of them succumbed to the darkness but my question is who was the first one to create it? Because in order to go to the tower in the first place, we needed a catalyst, an event of some sorts, where it would then need to be, to be taken place in order for it to occur. Which then splits off on one of the four paths. But the only thing that would stop me from thinking that is the fact that one of the final cutscenes in the game was that it was on behalf of Ruby's perspective where she wanted the characters to go through this journey to punish her. But Ruby did not get the punishment that she wanted and therefore she is currently suffering until she then forgives herself. Mira. Ruby's true self, who is just as loud and obnoxious a character, but honestly, who would have her any other way? Like Ruby, I had a ton of fun writing Mira's dialogue, however, her backstory was the last I came up with, and probably the one I struggled with the most with. I didn't make any sense there. I wanted to give her a trauma that affects her ability to trust others, 
and I wanted to be a dramatic enough to fit with the other three stories while still being somewhat realistic. So that's why her tragic past reads a bit like a spy novel. Lol. It also allowed for the threat mirror fears to be real and deadly enough to trigger paranoia, psychosis and eventually murder. Essentially, it all served to further my goal of having a villain who was both tragic and scarily over the top. But honestly, knowing a lot of the angry type behaviour isn't act actually makes her a bit less scary than some of the other characters. But that doesn't change the heart attack I got while editing her bust art. Rip me. <laughs> so that's all in this section. We've got... Okay, that's, that's actually where Ruby belongs, really. In that area. Art gallery, please, 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 please. Before we get... Why are you here? I don't know you. Um, you look like someone that I know. Welcome to the art gallery here. You can look at all of the artwork put together by Tour Vera's talented art team. When viewing the galleries, press the left and right buttons to scroll through the images and press X or escape to cancel. Be sure to talk to the artists themselves for a special message for each. Yay. I know. I was speaking of something along the lines of there would be a note from the developer as well. Okay, let's start from here. Howdy, neighbor. Uh, I'm Queen. You can find me on Twitter. There you go. Title and ending art by Quee. Yes, please. Ah. Ooh. Oh. Ah. Would that have been a bad ending then? That's vi that's this of this variation. So imagine there'll be three more variations. And because of the way that the light is showing, you see where Ruby's standing where the kind of like the red light is glowing towards her. I believe that it would also face in other positions though. Like the light would only shine towards the evil character in Ruby's sense, but it would shine towards the southwest one of the other characters, the top right for one of the other characters, and then the last one would be for the top left. Yay, that's lovely. Okay. Hiya, I'm Queenie, and I'm the lead developer, composer, writer, and giver of monies to artists far more talented than myself. Queenie, you've done good. You've done very good with this game. Don't ever doubt yourself, okay? If you're watching this, don't doubt yourself for one minute. Because I'm proud of what you've created. If you want to see some of the concept art I came up with, feel free, but be warned we're not all that great. Or if you'd rather save your eyeballs, you can listen to some of my sweet tunes instead. Thanks again for playing the game. Aww. Yes, please. You know what? Everyone starts from somewhere. Yay. No. We. Yay. No. We. Yay. Aww. All of these are wonderful. No matter how bland you say they are, they are wonderful. Hmm. Stop it. I don't know what we do from here now. Oh, I like that actually. It's a good one to end off with. Hello, I've had as much fun playing Torvir as I did both drawing the cutscene art and crying to TZ over every spoiler she shared. Mika? The real dark one was actually the friends we made along the way. Cute cutscene. Yeah, cutscene art by Mika. Let's see. Prologue. I like this. Nice with thumbnail um, stuff as well. Yep, 
These are wonderful. See, that's what I thought was the original Dark One. A, a combination of all the dark emotions and energies that have been drawn together by the negative emotions of humanity over the course of thousands and thousands of years into this one horrific being. But alas, we was wrong. That's what we was led to believe, because if it was revealed that it was one of our friends which were like this, then the surprise wouldn't have been there. Moved up to the top of the tower. And then the kingdom fell into ruin. Yikes. And then the four came together to stop this being. And then... Yes, please. Reveal. All together. The angel that is Amrita. Amatel. The Dark One, which has destroyed the resemblance of the angel itself, or destroyed the seal actually that prevented Ruby from being tarnished in the first place. Four gods. This was Ruby slowly becoming to sickness as a representation of one of the four gods. Yikes. Even before the cutscene where Ruby appeared last, the redness indicated the fact that it was Ruby who was the one that was corrupted. Otherwise, wouldn't it have been a different eye colour? Yeah, this was the point because these three characters appeared first and then Ruby appeared. That's what made me believe at first when we saw this that it was Ruby that was the one that was corrupted. You know, stuff like that. Small things. Hi, and thank you for playing Toro Vero. I'm the bust artist with this game, and you can find me outside of here by searching that name. On Google, on Twitter, anywhere you could possibly go, you would be able to find this name. Character Art Gallery. Yes, please. Which character would you like to... Bloody hell, there's a lot of them. Sigurd. Ah. Yay. Good. Good. Lovely. <laughs> we can't see like the darkened versions until we actually get to their variation of the um, art gallery. We're not going to be able to see them that lightly. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's like, now, 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 you drop that knife, okay? Another angry one. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> That's probably the most scariest face out of all of them, I'm not gonna lie. Ooh, terrified, sad, that. Oh, uh, there was more for Sigurd then? Hold on. Um, sorry, we'll go through this again then, shall we? A lot of emotions. Okay, we must have done. I didn't even realize that. The, the sound didn't even initiate in my head that was the end of the uh, that part of the gallery. Edric, our favorite mage. <laughs> Embarrassed. Feared. Angered. Smirking. Hmm. Unamused. Thinking. Another angry one. Petrified. Angry. 
Oh, it was just slightly less flush. You can see by, um, like, if you look in between the lens and the ear, there's like a little bit less red in there. It's like a fantastic representation because I've also got glasses. <laughs> this is all wonderful. I love this game from start to finish, despite the amount of times I rage over certain parts. It's all worth it in the end. Ruby. This is her wonderful version. <laughs> all of these are good. <laughs> Smirk. That's for good smirk. Mm. Still pre corrupted. No. Oh dear. <laughs> Flustered. Yee. Okay. This is pre corruption. This is post corruption. Or corrupted, anyways. <laughs> Gosh, that is terrifying. I can't imagine the face that Queenie made the first time when she saw these um, evil variants of Ruby. Gosh. Wow. <laughs> this is maximum perverted mode. Damn it, why does it have to end on this one? It looks like Ruby Stone to my soul. You dare leave us. You dare leave us, okay? You make me like I'm going to leave anyways. Imagine if like a jump scare just came out towards you like Don't you dare leave me <laughs> More to it Alright, Amy Yay All of these wonderful <laughs> Oh dare you call me a young girl. Do you know who I am? I will one day save your butt. Cheeky smile. Ooh. <laughs> Gosh, you're scared. Don't be scared. Your friends were there to save you. In the beginning. Now the angel. <laughs> wow. Once upon a time. Ouch. I'm glad you were there with us. To take the place of Ruby with your own archer. Aww. <laughs> okay, I think that was Queenie's reaction when she saw <laughs> those evil variants of Ruby. I think that was it. <laughs> uh, how dare ye! Now, the real versions of our main characters. Ryan. <laughs> I had a friend in my secondary school who uh, suffered cancer and won, thankfully. Lost all his hair. I wasn't quite sure what it was, but he did suffer from something back then. And he's always a very nice fellow as well, just like this one is. Just so you know that life is full of surprises, and some of those surprises are very deadly and dark ones. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> All these arts are brilliant. I find any art brilliant, to be honest. Well, well aside from the dark side of the internet, obviously. Let's not venture there, okay? Um. Melissa. And this bit of background music and the chapel one were also my other favourites of this game. And the other boss themes. Like the first boss theme, the second boss theme, as in like the skin of despair. Everything, really. Nah. <laughs> Similar. <laughs> that, was, that was always going to get me. 
That's probably Queenie's face when she realizes, don't make Ruby's face that evil, please, artist. No, I'm gonna make her look as evil as possible. I want you to drown in anger while you continuously look at this face and know that this face is in your game. <laughs> uh, this is easily one of my most favorite, favorite RPG Maker experiences ever. A very, very refreshing change from the normal phase of just experiencing a very, 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 very recycled process of horror. While this has culminated horror into a very, very, very refined deep story. Ah, <laughs> Melissa, don't cry. Okay, we got got to find a happy one. There we go. We're ending on that one, okay? <laughs> Don't escape! Look at my happy face! <laughs> right. Peter. Hi there. Oh dear. Urgh. Frown. Another sort of normal one. That one. Flustered. Jeez. Excuse me. I know this video has been very long, but I do want to see this, just like I've seen the developer's room in Prom Dreams. Hello there. Look at all these. Scared! Oh dear, how dare you do that to Melissa? Nah. Yikers. Hmm. Oh dear. <laughs> Gosh, I've gone let out this far, but I really don't want to. Especially not in front of Melissa. <laughs> That's literally what that face is, is holding a fart. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, not sorry. Now, finally. Mirror. Nah. <laughs> this is the mirror slash ruby we prefer. The non evil one. You can't combine pervertedness and evil together. Otherwise, you get the ultimate concoction of. Ultimate and utter destruction and annihilation. <laughs> Aw. Yeeks. <laughs> that smirk. I am the ultimate trash queen or extraordinaire. Eek. Hi. Ooh. Yeeks. <laughs> Still pre corruption. Pre corruption? Nice. Oh dear. Oh. Pre corruption. Wait. Um. No, there's still life in her, li her eyes. No, this is. That's pre corruption. This is post corruption. Oh dear. Oh dear. Oh dear indeed. Gosh. It's scary enough for me on a smaller screen, but for you guys with a bigger screen and... Well, I've already got the other screen where I can see the preview of me and this screen, and honestly, that's a bad look. <laughs> that's like your mother telling you off after you've done something bad. Or some... or quote-unquote bad, anyways. Hmm. <laughs> you. <laughs> you think you can get my mags? That's a laugh, don't you think about doing that? Oh, Gilea. You don't go anywhere near my anime. Don't go near my anime, and don't talk about my waifu like that. Or that will happen to you. But you think I won't do it to your friend as well? <laughs> well, well, let's see about that. <laughs> You're not laughing anymore, are you? Not talking about my favourite waifu like that, are you? I'm going to eradicate all of you if you dare talk about my waifu like that. Please don't talk about her like that, please. Hmm. You're going to continue to run away from me. You know that I'm much too fast to be evaded. So now your time has come near. You got any last words? I don't think so. Ah! You're still alive. Well, then, one last stab. Uh. Please don't. No. Oh, grayed out versions. 
<laughs> oh, I swear every character has an amount of portraits. Right, last thing. Hey, it's your boy Amy, or please draw me on most social media. Thanks so much for playing the game, and I hope you liked all those good, good monster boys I helped create it. Follow me for more cute and slime related content. Yes, welcome to this anime while I'm incarnated as a slime. If you know what I mean, then yeah. Enemy art by Amy C. Yes, please. Slime! Bat! Spider! That boulder guy! Ah, the ice sprite guy. Ice wolf. The crystal bollards. The grief eaters. These are the main diverging points in which character becomes evil. The ice. The ice guardian. The venom wing. The uh, heart trapper. The nagger. Ah, oh, you again. How dare you. Skeleton Warrior. Ah, oh, that's a guy with the ability called Deadly Flare. You're the bloated woman who's always got something in her belly. You're the one who thinks that you're all creepy from Frambo. And that's your other variant from Frambo. Seriously, that does look like a character that would suit in Frambo. Like one of the hospital patients. Um a boulder guardian kind of personnel grave keeper an ice elemental unicorn wait where's the fire and wind ones unicorn these halflings false idols the dragon ruby mirror and that folks wraps up everything it's been a long journey, I know, and this is probably close to being as long, or if not as long, as my Let's Play of Witch's Heart, which has still got more content to come. But anyway, throw that out of the window. This is a fantastic, absolutely breathtaking RPG Maker game. I'm not fond of turn based strategy games, but this one has definitely been very 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 good minus the odd times where rng has been against us such as the probability of an enemy spawning when we're under leveled the number of times where we couldn't escape when we were under leveled putting that aside this is one of my favorite games ever story perspective it's fantastic and all the tragedies that happened within the game so I would say if you've watched all of my videos to the full extent, I'll just say thank you so much for being on this journey with me. And thank you so much to everyone who has contributed towards the development of this game because this has been an absolute blast for personally for me and all of you who have been watching as well. Be sure to comment down below on which character is your favorite personally for me. All four of these characters have a unique blend to them. I would say through like experiences throughout life, I would partially relate to at most with Edric. Um, my personality wise, I think I have a kind heart nature like Lydia and I have a bit of a charismatic nature too like Ruby along with a kind hearted nature too like uh, Sigurd has as well so I like all these four characters in different ways if I were to have a personal favorite I would say good boy Francis is <laughs> I'm joking all these characters are lovely picking just one character though would be too difficult it's like picking your favorite child it's just not possible but thank you so much for watching guys and see you all within a within another video sorry about that i've just been talking for over two hours straight <laughs> i think it's been that long anyways but thank you so much for watching and have a wonderful day and take care of yourselves peace out and happy developing happy bright futures to all of you may you all be blessed with four gods divine wishes in that you 
will make it to heaven. Paradise. Your end game is not there yet because you are watching me do this outro. Take care of yourselves and always have a better tomorrow. Have a wonderful day and take care of yourselves.